I hoped he'd listen. Sometimes he did, sometimes he didn't. His hand beckoned me forward. I felt myself zoom up until I faced him. Thankfully, he decided to listen this time. What do you seek from me? He asked. I'd long since ceased being afraid of him, but I'd never felt comfortable with him. Whatever name religions gave him, the warden of the gateway to the netherworld was not a relaxing figure. I need an hour to pass in my world, but no more than two, before you return me to the ones I marked with my blood. He didn't smile. That would be too human a reaction, but the faintest flicker in his expression made me wonder if I'd amused him. Do you? I'd once begged him for something he didn't give me, so I didn't know what my odds were with this request. Unlike the other one, this was small, and hopefully, he was in a generous mood. Please, I said. This is very important. He extended a hand and a small, narrow vessel appeared on the river. You know the cost of a bargain with me and what you forfeit if you fail. Oh, I'll fill your boat, I said with grim purpose. Without another word, I was zooming backward and the warden, the river, and everything else faded from my sight. Then brightness exploded in my vision and I saw the tops of buildings as if I were falling from a great height. I instinctively braced, but I didn't have a body, so I felt no impact when I hit one of them. I went through several floors, everything blurring, before I found myself looking down on an underground parking garage. Ian was there, and he looked far more worse for wear than when I'd last seen him. He had multiple silver harpoons protruding from him that were secured by chains. No fewer than a dozen vampire guards held the other ends of those chains. The tips of the harpoons must have been hooks, because every time Ian moved, they ripped open large pieces of his flesh. The Samargal was there, too, chained inside a metal cage. The Nordic vampire stood next to the cage. From the way he kept checking his watch, he was expecting company soon. Time to crash this party. I aimed for Ian's shoulder that I'd marked with my blood and everything went black. Before I could see again, I caught snatches of conversation. Where'd all those ashes come from? They're pouring out of his shoulder. Look. Now something's moving in them. It's big. It's coming up out of the ashes. What is it? Holy shit, it, it looks like a woman. I brushed my silvery gold and blue hair out of my eyes, my gaze finding Ian. For a split second, I saw him through the otherness in me, instead of my vampire nature. Lights burst from him, hallmarks of the integrity and inner nobility I already knew he had. But darkness also swirled around those lights, and it wasn't only from his brands. Ian had had inner demons long before he made his deal with Dagon. At that same moment, Ian looked at me. Recognition lit his face, making me glad I'd showed him this appearance before. I'd half expected him to be frightened when he realized I was the creature forming from the ashes near his feet. His captors certainly screamed as if gripped by terror but elation washed over Ian's expression. Then he bent to yank me into his arms, despite the harpoons tearing bigger holes into his flesh. A spray of his blood hit me. 
Rage took over. They had hurt him. They had hurt him and he let them because I'd told him to go with them. Now, I would avenge every single drop of his blood. I let my hands grip his for the briefest moment. Then, naked except for the ashes clinging to me, I launched myself at Ian's captors. The good thing about having my former body explode is that it cured me of my hangover. This new body wasn't exhausted or filled with chemicals. That meant I was at full magical and physical capacity. I unleashed my powers like a fireworks finale on the 4th of July. Truth be told, I might have been showing off a little. Ian had really impressed me with his fighting skills. Now, I was showing him what I could do. When I was finished, nothing in the garage moved except me, Ian and the Samargo, who was doing circles in his cage in excitement. Missed you too, I told him, making a mental note to give the Samargal a name as soon as possible. I pulled a coat off one of the dead guards. The coat was bloodstained, but it was black, so the blood didn't show as much on it. It would have to do until I could get some real clothes. I shook the worst of the gore off it before I put it on. Then I pushed my hair back, wishing I had a clip or hair tie. The long tricolored mass always seemed to swirl around my shoulders as if blown by a hidden breeze when it was down. Finally, I used magic to blunt the forked edges of the harpoons embedded in Ian so I could remove them without taking out more hunks of his flesh. When they were all out, Ian stared at the dismembered remains of the bodies, at the wreckage done to several cars in the garage, and then, finally, at me. His former elation was gone. Now, the full weight of everything that had happened was in his gaze. I told you I'd see you again, I said in a feeble attempt to lighten the tenseness of the situation. That you did. He let out a short laugh. And then you exploded all over me. A weird sense of shyness overtook me. Then again, I had exposed myself in the most extreme way possible by doing that, so perhaps it wasn't so weird. Still, I tried to deflect. It looked worse than it was. You saw your shapeshifter friend temporarily die when she let herself get decapitated by the council's executioner. Stop, he said shortly. No more lies, half-truths, or omissions. At first, I thought you were a demon-possessed vampire because you could do magic by your will alone, something no vampire can do. Then I tasted your blood and thought you were demon branded, like me. Thought it was Dagon who'd branded you and that's why you wanted him dead, but now. I have no idea what you are. You're right, I've seen demon branded people die before. They don't spontaneously catch fire and explode. They also don't rise from a pile of ashes that somehow poured from the same spot where you marked me, and their eyes don't glow silver like yours did, so for the last time, what are you? I found myself wishing I was still drunk. It would be so much easier to admit to this next part if I had chemicals numbing my nervousness. You know about the vampire half. The other half. I gave a hapless shrug. Depending on the culture or beliefs, there are different names. Demigod. Nephilim. Phoenix. Titan. Hellspawn. 
Was one of your parents an angel, a demon, or a god? He interrupted. Only Tenek had ever known the truth about me, and he'd exhorted me countless times to tell no one. All those long ago warnings rang in my head as I said, I once asked my father what he was because I couldn't figure it out. He never answered me, and he's not the type you press. You'll see what I mean. His gaze narrowed. What do you mean, I'll see? My swipe encompassed the corpses strewn around the garage. I couldn't come to you immediately or you'd still be at the hotel with too many innocent people close by. I also couldn't wait too long or they would have delivered you to Dagon. For that kind of precision, I had to make a suitably large offering. My father will be here soon to collect it. As if that had summoned him, half the garage suddenly turned into blackest darkness, and a ghostly boat sailed over a river that morphed out of nowhere. Ian screamed when he saw the figure at the boat's helm, his pale skin turning dead white. It's all right. I said quickly. He's not here for you. He's here for them. Ian's gaze swung back toward me with a mixture of horror and disbelief. The bloody Grim Reaper is your father? What you're seeing isn't what he really looks like. On this side of the veil, you see what you fear. I see an enormous cloaked skeleton wielding a huge scythe, Ian said promptly. That's not what you see. I looked at my father, seeing a tall man with silver, gold, and blue hair, strikingly beautiful features, and deep bronze skin. The warden's true form was so similar to my real appearance, I had to constantly wear the glamour disguise of a slim blonde law guardian to avoid being recognized as his child. No, that's not what I see, I said, meeting my father's lightning-like gaze, before I looked away. Then I gestured to Ian's former guards. Your offering, Warden. My father extended his hand and ghostly visages rose up from the corpses before they were compelled into his boat. None went happily. They all screamed much the way Ian had when he saw my father. The only one who wasn't afraid was the Samargal. He pressed against the bars of his cage as much as his chains allowed, making noises that were similar to happy yips. My father looked at him and gave him the barest nod, the highest form of approval I'd ever seen from him. You will care for him, he told me. A command, not a request. His prior owner treated him in an unworthy manner. I will inform him of the change. I didn't mind the order. I'd already decided to do that anyway. But I was surprised by that last part. You know who his former owner is? For the second time, I was sure I'd amused my father even though his expression didn't change. Yes. It is day gone, and he was just leaving. Ian and I turned around at the same moment. I couldn't see my expression, but it was probably as shocked as Ian's when I saw that Dagon had, at some point, materialized behind us. I hadn't seen Dagon in over 4,000 years. The demon looked exactly the way I'd remembered, tall, blonde, boyishly handsome and with a little smirk that rarely faded no matter what atrocities he was inflicting. That smirk grew when he saw Ian, then dropped entirely when he looked at me. Damn it. 
I hadn't taken the time to reapply my glamour, so Dagon would only see the law guardian appearance I'd been hiding under. You, he said in astonishment. I thought by now you had to be dead. I'd had countless dreams about what would happen when I finally faced Dagon again. The details varied, but they all ended with me stabbing Demon Bone through his eyes to send him to the fate he so richly deserved. Now, I was caught off guard and unprepared, but I couldn't let him see how rattled I was. You of all people should know how hard I am to kill. Hatred dripped from every syllable. Dagon's smirk returned when he heard it. I fought not to tremble from a mixture of blind rage and remembered despair. Time was supposed to lessen the intensity of all things, yet in that moment, I hated and feared Dagon just as much as I had all those millennia ago, when I'd been nothing more than his favorite prop. He wagged a finger at me in the playful way people did when they caught a child being naughty. You must be the troublemaker who divested me of my latest soul acquisition. Very clever of you to mute the tether in Ian's brands, but now, it's time for me to take him back. I moved in front of Ian before either he or Dagon had a chance to twitch. He's not going anywhere with you. Dagon's face darkened like a sky full of deadly weather. Isn't he? You should remember what happens to people who upset me. Is that a threat? My father asked the question in the mildest tone. Dagon still stiffened as if he'd been slapped. Of course not, my lord, he said, laughing as if we'd all shared a joke. That would violate our agreement. It would, so you may leave now, the Warden of the Gateway, to the Netherworlds replied. Again, it wasn't a suggestion. Dagon smiled at my father, but gave me and Ian a look that promised bloody vengeance. Then, he disappeared. My father didn't look at me but I knew he would make sure Dagon didn't pop back up to murder us anytime soon. He might not care for me in the way that mortals cared for their children, but he wouldn't tolerate one of his commands being broken only hours after giving it. That, I could count on. Of course, that command went both ways. Long ago, my father had commanded me never to kill Dagon. I fully intended to go back on that order. And Dagon might not try to kill me today, but he would absolutely start plotting my murder now that he knew I was still alive. When it came to our hatred of each other, neither of us was rational or obedient. My father didn't look at me when he left. He simply turned that boat full of screaming spectral passengers around and sailed back into the unfathomable darkness he'd appeared from. Then that darkness vanished, replaced by the blandness of the garage with the smashed cars and the bodies strewn around it. I went over to the Samargal's cage and broke it, then unwound him from all the chains around him. As soon as the Samargal was free, he started flying around me in happy circles. I'm going to call you Silver, I told him. Do you like that? An enthusiastic yip was my answer. Silver it was, then. I looked at Ian. He still hadn't moved except for his eyes. They raked over me, the body-filled room, and the area where my father had appeared and disappeared. His face was no longer as pale as fresh snow, but his jaw was set so tight, I could hear the cartilage cracking from the strain. 
The silent tension grew until I couldn't stand it anymore. Don't worry, I don't expect you to be okay with this. The vampire race defaults to rejecting people who are a combination of different species. I let out a sharp laugh. I should know, I've tried and failed to stop the hostilities that have boiled over between vampires and ghouls when abominations like me are discovered. Ian might have been against Katie's execution, but there was a world of difference between not wanting your friend's child to be murdered and continuing to partner with someone who was half vampire and half of a species that couldn't easily be named. Worse, my powers were everything vampires and ghouls feared when they talked about the perils of mixing different species together. It's fine, I went on. All I ask is that you don't reveal what you know about me to anyone else. Tenek would have killed him to ensure his silence. Once, I would have, too. At some point during the short amount of time we'd spent together, I'd started to care for Ian. That was supremely stupid of me, but it was still true. We'll go our separate ways, I continued more briskly. Dagon still can't find you with your brands muted, so you'll be fine if you keep yourself hidden. I still intend to take him down, so you'll really be fine once he's dead. If I kill him, the pessimistic part of me added, but I didn't say it out loud because I was trying to sound confident. I was also trying not to show how much it would hurt when Ian turned around and walked away. But Tenek had long prepared me for people being unable to accept what I was. Watching millions slaughter each other over far fewer differences during the thousands of years of my life had proved Tenet correct. I was so sure of Ian's rejection, it took a moment for me to register what he was saying. Don't know about you, but I'm starving. Feels like I haven't had a decent meal in days. What? His reaction to this momentous revelation couldn't be something as simple as hunger. He also pulled a coat from a dead guard, shook it so the worst of the gore flew off, and put it on. Then he walked over and gave me a light whack on the ass. Half deaf as well as half demigod, hmm. What? Your ears didn't fully regenerate along with the rest of you. I'll say it louder, then, follow me. I'm peckish and I know the perfect place where we can indulge in a feeding splurge. Chapter 25 I did a warding spell on the Samargal so that Dagon wouldn't be able to track him from his blood anymore. Thank you, Nordic Vampire, for spilling that important detail. Then I covered his cage with another dead guard's coat so his wings didn't attract stairs when we went outside. Several blocks later, Ian banged on a side door labeled Crimson Fountain, employee entrance. The door opened and a young woman with purple hair and dark eye makeup appeared. Job interviews don't start for another hour, she began then stopped when she got a good look at Ian. But you can wait inside, she added, her scent changing until lust covered the heavy chemical tang from her perfume. Grand, he said, walking into the building. I followed, which made the corner of her mouth curl down in disappointment. Then Ian's gaze captured hers and his eyes turned green. Gather together the rest of the employees and bring them here. She turned around without another word. Minutes later, about half a dozen people shuffled into the narrow hallway. Is this everyone? Ian asked the purple-haired girl. So far, she said. 
more will show up after 6 when the main shift starts. Bring them to me as soon as they come in. As for the rest of you, his bright green gaze landed on each until they were all under his thrall. You don't see me, this woman, or our creature until we tell you that you do. You don't hear us, either. Now, go about your business as usual. They turned and walked away, some wondering out loud why Dahlia had asked them to come see an empty hallway. Cancel the interviews for today, Ian told Dahlia next. But before you do that, show us the VIP section and turn the music on. It's quiet as a tomb in here. She nodded, and we followed her through what was obviously a club. I was surprised to see wooden coffins set up around the stage. Then I noticed large glass fangs over the bar, mock headstones making up the backs of chairs, and stakes for some of the beer taps and understood. Now, the cheesy name for the establishment made sense. You brought us to a fake vampire bar? Ian set Silver's cage down beside the bar, then threw a grin at me. The owner and I are friendly, though he thinks I'm another poser, instead of a real vampire. Doesn't know a bit about the undead world, either, poor fellow. That's why Dagon would never think to look for us here. He was right. I'd expected us to either flee the city or run to an ally's house. Not go to a club that was a bad stereotype for everything humans normally thought of when they heard the word vampire. Think it's safe to let him out? Or will he eat the staff? Ian asked, tracing the bars on Silver's cage. Simargles are vegetarian, I replied, offended on Silver's behalf. Bring him whatever veggies you've got, he told Dahlia when she came back after turning the music on. She'd turned the house lights down and the club lights on. Now, the club was mostly dark except for multicolored beams that crisscrossed over the empty dance floor and the occasional fog or strobe effect. VIP sections over here, Dahlia said, walking up a flight of stairs. After I petted Silver and told him to stay, I followed Dahlia to the second floor. In the far corner, ropes and curtains cordoned a room with long black couches, its own bar, and a great view of the dance floor, if you kept the curtains open. Ian didn't. He closed them and took his coat off before lounging on the nearest couch. Dahlia's gaze swept over Ian's bare upper body as if he'd compelled her to memorize every detail of how his creamy skin stretched over muscles that rippled with his slightest movement. When she licked her lips, I found myself bristling with what could only be jealousy. Ridiculous. I'd promised Ian an orgy on my dime as soon as this was over. How could I be resentful of someone merely looking at him? But I was so much that my scent soured until I might as well have sprayed myself down with a bottle labeled Jealous Bitch. Ian's gaze touched mine. I quickly glanced away. He couldn't know about my latest irrational flash of possessiveness. By the gods, I still needed to have some secrets from him. She's obviously into you, so you should start your feeding splurge with her, I said, trying to prove I didn't care about anything that might happen between the two of them. Ian's mouth curled into a slow grin. Great. He probably sensed my possessiveness and was amused by it. You're being a fool. I told myself sternly. It didn't matter. 
After everything that had happened, I was out of the reserves I normally drew from to hide what I was feeling. But I didn't have to stand here and be mocked for it. I spun around. I'm going to check on Silver. Wait. It wasn't the command in Ian's tone that stopped me. It was the dangerous amount of intensity in his gaze when I turned back around. We stared at each other. An electric jolt went through me when his smile faded and naked hunger overtook his expression. Come back here, Veritas. The new throatiness in his voice beckoned me more than his words. Once again, the smart move would be to walk away. Instead, I found myself walking toward them as if I'd been hypnotically compelled. I didn't even have Red Dragon to blame my actions on anymore. His gaze filled with green. I didn't need to see my eyes to know that mine had probably started glowing green, too. An unbearable need swept over me, drowning out everything else. Yes, I should turn around and leave. But I didn't want to. Go, Ian told Dahlia, the vibration in his voice telling me he used his power on her. Close the drapes behind you. Don't come back or even think about us until I summon you. Dahlia left at once. Seeing her go gave me a brief moment of sanity. I started to follow her, but Ian got up and grabbed me. I stared at the pale hands gripping my arms instead of at him. What do you think you're doing? I asked in a low voice. This. I gasped when he yanked me down onto the couch. All my nerve endings jumped at the feel of his hard body on top of mine. I considered saying what a bad idea this was, but discarded that when his mouth covered mine.